Hi, welcome and thank you for joining City Parks Alliance for our discussion on how park organizations are planning for the summer and fall activities. I'm Karen Ernst, I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives at the City Parks Alliance and I'll be moderating today's discussion. As the weather warms and our thoughts turn to summer, most park professionals are already well underway with planning summer activities, summer camps, movie nights, festivals, but with the current uncertainty, many organizations find themselves wondering how they're going to adapt their programs or whether they can hold them at all. Today, we're here, going to hear from three park organizations who are proactively and creating planning or uh, proactively and creatively planning for contingencies for their summer programs and beyond. Though the summer may look different this year, they am, aim to provide the best uh, possible experience for residents as well as the services that people most need. Uh, the, today, we're going to be hearing from Justin Hellier, who is the Strategic Advisor at Seattle Parks and Recreation, Lakima Bell, the Get Moving Initiative Strategic Advisor at Seattle Parks and Recreation, Allison Watkins, the Chief Strategy Officer for Austin Parks Foundation, and Dutch, uh, Dave Hutch, the Director of Planning and Park Development at the Vancouver Board of Parks and Recreation. If you missed something during today's presentation, don't worry. Uh, links to the recording as well as related resources are going to be emailed to all registrants after the webinar. So let's get started. We'll begin by having our speakers uh, from each city give us a brief presentation, and then we're going to be moving to questions that attendees submitted when they registered for the webinar. So for our speakers, uh, what we'd like you to talk about are issues such as scenario planning and risk assessment, summer camps, volunteer management, uh, communication with residents, and data collection in parks to inform ongoing safe park use and to measure the impact of parks. So Justin and Lakima from Seattle, how about if we start with you? Great. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for, for having us here. We're like you trying to figure out exactly what the future looks like uh, for us. So we wanted to, and I, I just want to step back and start by saying a lot of what we'll share today is um, still in thinking mode, still in planning mode. Not a lot of this has been sort of formally blessed by our, our uh, elected officials. And so we're really sharing kind of that, that thinking and planning mode. Um, I also want to say this represents the work of a lot of folks throughout the department who've worked really hard to figure out this, this puzzle. Um, so I, I wanted to start just by presenting kind of a conceptual model for how we're thinking about uh, the reopening, right? And and it started with kind of a, the current state of kind of an unprecedented closure uh, of all our operations or significant number, right? We've got community centers closed, pools closed, most of our programs canceled or suspended. Um, and you're hearing from two folks who work on the recreation side of the house. So there's a, there's a lot more going on outdoors, but uh, we're not going to talk too much about that. At the same time of this closure, we've also got a significant number of emergency services that we've ramped up in response to COVID-19. So we've got several homeless shelters operating in closed community centers. Uh, we have hygiene sites, so places with showers and a bathroom where folks who don't otherwise have access to those can, can get access. We've opened up emergency child care focused on uh, first responder families and, and other uh, transit workers and things like that. Um, and a variety of other emergency services, right, that I think other folks will speak to, kind of social distance ambassadors and park outdoor folks. Um, so that's kind of where we're at now, right? And a, a significant amount of our energy is, is consumed on providing these emergency services. We know at some point that this kind of lockdown phase will come to an end and will start to slowly reopen, um, that some of these emergency services will slowly ramp down. But we know that when we reopen, it's not going to be like flipping on a light switch, right? We're not going from zero to 100% instantly for a variety of reasons. One, uh, public health restrictions really won't let us do that. Two, right, we'll still be using some of our staff capacity on some of these emergency services. Um, and three, uh, we're not sure what the public demand is going to be. Um, and four, there's, there's likely to be some, some savings targets for the year, uh, given the economic condition, right? So less than thinking of it as reopen, we're kind of thinking of it as ramping up. So how do we um, how do we ramp up to what is actually our, our normal operations rather than rather than going from zero to one hundred, you know we're slowly ramping up over the course of the year. We also know that uh, 
the next year may look different than the current year because of potential long-term public health restrictions and the potential for long-term budget cuts, right? So the new normal we're ramping up to is gonna look different than, than we started this year. So this is you know, really high level concept, but kind of how we're approaching this planning that, that as we move from this closure and emergency phase to over the long term, what, what the new normal is, we're gonna be really conscious of how we're slowly ramping up our services based on public health restrictions, based on customer demand, based on our staff capacity, and based on the impact of any budget, uh, budget reductions. So, uh, so as we approach planning for the future, or for the summer, I should say, um, I mean, one of the first things we've done is pull together a team of folks who's, you know, while some of our folks are focused on emergency shelter, some on emergency childcare, we've, we've actually pulled together a group of people to focus on the future. And I think that's been incredibly helpful. Um, and here's how we're looking at it. In a normal year, um, we, like many of you, run a huge summer operation, huge expanded summer camps. We're the number one provider of childcare in the city any time of year, but that's especially true during the summer. We lifeguard nine major beaches. We've got a 22 waiting pools throughout the city. We have a whole bunch of other kinds of programming we run, including just normal programming operating out of our community centers, right? Your pottery class, your drop-in pickleball, and all of that. And again, everything else that happens outside, but uh, you, won't, you won't hear about that from me. Um, and, and as we've approached this planning process for the first few weeks, I think I was really had in my head, like how much of normal can we do, right? And, I, and when you ask that question, um, you start to at, say things like, well, we can slowly open up buildings. We might be able to have drop-in, uh, you know, some managed drop-in, right? Uh, but it would be harder to do kind of registered programs because of the uncertainty it might lead you to that kind of thinking. Um, at a certain point, I realized I wanted to really rethink about it differently, right? That rather than thinking how much of normal can we do, really ask what are the core things the community needs from us this summer and how can we be a part of providing that, right? So it's really like right now in our emergency time, we're under a continuity of operations plan um, that uh, really pushes resources toward mission essential functions. And I think even as we move out of that emergency stage, we still need, given the limited resources, given the limited staff capacity, given the uncertainty around public health guidance, we still need to be thinking with that essential functions frame. And, and as an example, uh, and again, this is just pure, still planning and thinking, not yet fully approved, but I think we're, we're thinking about, is childcare one of our mission essential functions for the summer? And if you do that, right, and you start to operate your childcare programs under the, the public health guidelines that we think we can, um, you start to realize that there's not actually a lot of room in those buildings for things like drop-in, right? So if you just ask how much a normal can we do, you might get one set of answers. If you ask uh, what are the essential functions we need to perform this summer, you get a very different set of answers. Um, you know, speaking in particular to our summer camp, I want to be a little hesitant because we're still still thinking and planning, but uh, we do hope to, um, the current date for registration for those programs is May 12th. We are developing a plan to, to do that, to open registration for some of our programs then, um, not yet formally vetted and approved, um, but we think that that's gonna be a really good uh, measure of customer demand uh, and an important service that we can provide. Um, but we think given public health restrictions on number of youth in a cohort, uh, you know, number of folks that can congregate in a building, that we're gonna have a significantly smaller um, summer operation than we normally do and that there's gonna be a gap um, there. I think, and that's always true, right? For a variety of reasons, whether it's uh, economic inequality and a wide variety of reasons, there are always young people who are not engaged in formal summer care. And so we've got a small program we run each year called Summer of Safety that's essentially a, a structured drop-in program outdoors at parks, um, at certain sites around the city where you've got you know, you've got a recreation leader there helping folks play games, get a free lunch, do a little bit of arts and crafts. And it's not formal registered care, but it's um, it's sort of a safety net to keep those those young people safe. We know they're going to be at the park or wander in the neighborhood anyway. Let's put our resources there to help help support them. I think we are contemplating expanding that program this summer. Again, thinking and planning, not formally approved, but we are contemplating how we can think of summer care as really a a mission essential function that we push all our resources toward. Some of that happening through, uh, you know, public health approved um, uh, 
uh, formal care and then some of that through an expanded outdoor drop-in program. We're also having all these same kind of conversations about major events and uh, my colleague Lakima uh, is doing an excellent job thinking about scenario planning for one of our signature summer events. So I'll, I'll pass it over to you, Lakima. Thank you, Justin. Um, and so we have an event called the Big Day of Play, which draws about 3,700 attendees. Uh, and we plan for this event year round. And when I say we, it is a cross group of stakeholders that do different things in recreation from our aquatics to our specialized populations, to our lifelong recreation, to our environmental learning, to our um, urban foods programs, um, our community centers, activities, our athletics and tennis as well. So we put all these things together to provide an event that allows folks access opportunity and resources of which they may not have access to, this event is free. Uh, and so what we're doing right now in this committee is thinking of Big Day or Play three ways. Uh, essentially, it's an, it's an event that's at one of our community centers that is located in one of our most diverse neighborhoods in the country. Uh, and we also have a aquatics building that is very close and we provide transportation. Uh, and so with that 3,700 folks, about 70% are people of color. Uh, and that's intentionally done because we are looking to engage those, those folks in opportunities for access and resources. Are We have health vendors, we have fitness instructors, uh, anything from tennis uh, to Zumba uh, are all ways that you can engage for free. We also have jumpy toys. So every day, one of our three ways of thinking about it is every day. And so we're thinking about no gatherings greater than 250 people with enhanced attention to hygiene, uh, you know, about the three foot rule right now, you know, sticking with public health and CDC. We're also looking at six feet away, which is no gatherings greater than 50 people. And then of course, virtual. And so um, at this slide that you see up, you'll see the, the, implement, the implementation strategies on the left. So there's a few things that we do for all events, right? Logistics, emergency management, first aid, marketing, inclusive outreach, vendors, aquatics, the activities that we'll have, photography, videography, data collection, uh, access, our entertainment, you know, what are funding, sponsorships, grants, partnerships, collaborations, and volunteers, right? And so we, I have put that to the left so you can be able to have a visual of how that looks and changes given the three ways that we're looking at uh, possibly providing the big day of play event. So every day with the 250, we're looking at how can we do entry and, entry and exit controls, right? Um, uh, keeping in mind that we'll have liability notices like we do at a regular um, event. The community engagement, you know, they do door to door hangings, they do translations. That would be throughout all three strategies. Uh, we would lessen what the vendor looks like. We normally have 50 to, to 100. Uh, we'll look at doing half of that in regards to our vendor booths and, uh, of course, spacing so that we can ensure that three feet. If we go to six feet, we're now looking at Okay, not at the Rainier or at the Rainier event, the Rainier Community Center and location, but also in addition, maybe spilling out into some closed streets around the city uh, so that we can have less people there that would still have translated materials. It would still have food trucks, uh, but it would have less, maybe one food truck, uh, some farmer um, tents so that we can ensure that we have uh, produce because we know oftentimes uh, folks from these uh, communities are in food deserts, so we're looking to uh, address those inequities and also be on the grounds. We're looking at in opposed to person-to-person -person, um, engagement for data collection. You'll see that we utilized our community engagement ambassadors, which are folks from uh, different marginalized communities uh, that speak the languages that they're from that help with translation interpretation. Uh, we know that if you market and advertise in different languages, then people at the event need to be able to speak those said languages. So that's what the community engagement ambassadors are doing. They're engaging our communities that they represent. Also thinking about access. At our event at Big Day at Play, we have what we call a contemplation room. And now what this room is for is for folks that may have uh, overstimulation uh, situations, for folks that may need to pray, uh, folks that may need to just get um, a chill pill, if you will, uh, we provide that area so that folks don't have to leave the event in order to see about their needs, but they can actually see about their needs at the event and then come on back. 
So what does that look like at every day? Six feet away, we're looking at what would the neighborhoods where we're what neighborhoods are affected with health disparities and looking at engaging those neighborhoods with that uh, potential um, kind of block party engagement. And then also looking at digital divide and how do we mitigate this? Now, remember, these are all in the beginning stages of conversation. Uh, also keeping in hand that we need to ensure that stakeholders, both community organizations, nonprofits, our partners, uh, folks that we're um, engaging around to potential funding and grants have um, say in these communications, right? Um, so also looking at our funding and sponsorships, as I talked about before, it would look differently. So on the every day, uh, which is the 250 and under, we can still have banners. Uh, we can still have marketing materials there at the site with the six feet away. Now we're looking about uh, possibly sponsorship of each area to entice uh, potential sponsors. And then virtually, which would be across cross pollinated or all pages, uh, websites uh, with running ads under them and streaming live like many ads. Um, so engaging, we're doing a, a, a a phase approach of many vignettes of possible um, artists that will be at the event, um, many um, coupons or resources, um, engagements with Facebook Live and so forth. So really we're at the beginning stages. We have amazing people um, at the table looking to um, have this information and collaborate in a way that we can provide uh, programming for everyone. And so I thank you for that, and I am done. All right, thank you, Lakima and Justin. That was really terrific, and I pre uh, particularly appreciate the way you laid out the three different contingency plans of, depending on what the um, guidelines and restrictions are at the time that you do the event, you're planning out three different ways of approaching it, and I think that's a great framework for people to think of. We'll be sharing that particular resource with people afterwards. Um, so the next person who's going to be speaking is Allison Watkins, who's the Chief Strategy Officer at the Austin Parks Foundation. So I'm going to turn it over to Allison. Go ahead. Hi, thanks so much. Um, yes, I'm Allison Watkins of Austin Parks Foundation. Oh, um, and uh, thank you so much for having us and for letting us be here today and to talk about a few things. Um, so I'm going to share with you guys uh, a little bit about what we at Austin Parks Foundation are currently doing. Um, so I wanted to start off with just kind of sharing um, in the in the now um, what we're doing externally and then internally as well. Um, so in externally, uh, Austin Parks Foundation has done, I know that um, the City Parks Alliance has focused a lot of webinars already on this um, in terms of communications, but just wanted to share kind of uh, where our heads are at in terms of um, communicating with our external stakeholders. Um, I should also mention Austin Parks Foundation, we're a, about a 30 year old nonprofit organization that operates in Austin, Texas. Um, and we are there to support our parks and recreation department. Um, we do our own programming and, and um, you know, we, we help and fund uh, new park amenities and, and building of new parks. Um, but obviously with everything that's going on, we've really had a change in strategy and been pivoting um, as an organization to kind of do these three key things, which are around educating our constituents in our community, connecting with them, and hoping to inspire them. So um, I know some friends on uh, past webinars have shared how they've updated their websites. Um, wanted to share just a screenshot with you guys so you can see um, at, our, at our website, austinparks.org, this is how we're kind of transitioning. Um, so we've got key areas where people can learn how to be in their park safely and what the rules are and how to maintain social distancing and do everything that our local government is telling them to do. Um, Ways that people can find local green spaces. Um, Austin Parks Foundation, uh, as a nonprofit, uh, works in all uh, nearly 300 parks in the city of Austin. And um, kind of our marching orders and what we're really trying to educate people around is that you don't need to be traveling to a park that's far away. You don't need to go to those big downtown destination parks. We want people to be able to stay close to home. And so we have a great resource on our website that really shows people um, where they can find their local green
green spaces if they may not be as familiar with them. Um, and then bringing parks into the home. So a lot of the programming and activities that we do as an organization in parks, we've really tried to um, focus those around how you can do those in your own backyard. Um, so that's everything from mulching trees to um, you know activities you would do with your kids like seed ball making. Um, and so we've transitioned our blog um, and our little hummingbird society activities, which is our, our kids programming events to be more digital. So these are just screenshots of those areas. Um, we've got a ton of nature play activities and just things that parents can do with their kids around their house um, that really brings some of that park program that we would do um, in person in, in local parks into your own backyard and into your neighborhood. Um, and then again, our own little hummingbird society, which uh, is in the past, it's been um, a, a program that is, uh, it's, a, it's a fee for um, activities. So it's a $10 a month donation program that people get fun activities and volunteer activities um, in the local parks. And we now have made all of uh, our content free and available to everybody. Um, so by coming to our website, they can download booklets, they can uh, explore the, uh, the content online. Um, there's downloadable activities, there's printable activities. So just trying to really bring a lot of those resources that we would normally give to people um, in, a, in an in-person way, uh, making them digital and available to everyone. And then finally, uh, I wanted to share in terms of what we're doing internally. Uh, and again, this is just kind of from a communication standpoint. Um, our team, uh, we've got about uh, 25 team members uh, all across the city. Um, we are in shelter in place, so we're all working remotely from our homes. Um, but we want to make sure that we're connecting with our teams at all times. So um, we hold a weekly team meeting on Monday afternoons. Um, and then our leadership team, which is a small group of five individuals, also meets weekly um, on Thursday afternoons and for those team meetings we're really trying to uh, start with something light we want to make sure that we are uh, connecting with our team members as individuals and that we're hearing from them uh, we know that uh, web, web you know uh, web meetings and zooms can can be a little hard and that you don't hear from everybody you don't get to see everybody um, unless you do something intentional so we try to start each of our meetings with a sharing exercise so we can see each of our team members individually and hear a little bit from them um, so we've been sharing things like recipes with been making shows we've been watching inspiration that's coming from our neighborhoods of great things that our neighbors are doing for each other um, just little ways to get everybody to be able to be visible and to share in those meetings and then we have a collaborative agenda where we're hearing from our various uh, departments about good news and things that's happening um, important updates struggles that people are having that they need collaboration and help with um, and then we're also just trying to keep our traditions so um, our finance team is known for uh, their their car Tunes that they share in each of our uh, monthly team meetings and so they've been great about sharing a silly cartoon every team meeting that we have virtually um, we are continuing to honor birthdays and celebrations of our team members as well so just trying to keep as much of a semblance of routine as possible even though we're doing things virtually um, and then in terms of other work that we're doing uh, around forecasting, scenario planning, um, similar to the team in Seattle, we wanted to share with you just a few resources that we're using and we've created. Um, in terms of a budget standpoint, our finance team, uh, when this first started, began scenario planning in terms of a best, middle, worst case scenario. And we've been refining those over the last several weeks. Um, and we have uh, really been concentrating on cutting our unrestricted expenses and getting those as low as possible um, and so we actually have a board meeting next week that will be going to our board with a uh, a new for re forecast and a new budget for 2020 taking all of this into consideration um, and so we'll be sharing that with them and hopefully getting that adopted which will give us kind of our new marching orders in terms of how we'll be spending um, moving forward and then again, similar to what Lakima showed, we're going to be doing uh, scenario planning and we are doing scenario planning for all of our events and programming. Um, so whether that be uh, free events that we help put on in the park um, and various other programs that we do with our community um, for our park adopters, um, various things, fundraising events, everything is kind of going through this scenario planning lens. Um, so we're thinking it uh, about this in, th in terms of things that are in our control. And we're really talking about what are the details of those programs, what are the budget concerns? What are the new um, revenue projections that might come out of fundraising events? And then what are the ways that we're thinking about being creative in terms of building out some of these uh, scenarios? So one 
program I wanted to share. Uh, just uh, I know that some of you all uh, also run a Moves in the Park program. It's something that a lot of us uh, do across the, the nation in terms of uh, getting people free programming into parks. Um, we at Austin Parks Foundation run uh, Movies in the Park, uh, which happens uh, usually from late later middle spring until all the way until the winter time uh, because of our mild temperatures here in Texas. Um, but so we would be in the midst of holding movies in the park. We do about 10 movies a year at different neighborhood parks across the city. Um, and so we uh, halted that program obviously when everything happened. And now we've been scenario building um, kind of for our best middle and worst case scenarios. So I've outlined what those are here so you can see them um, in terms of you know our, our best case uh, in, in in regards to when our start date is um, and again a drop when a drop dead decision uh, would need to happen and then what the plan would be in case place and again this would be best cases that we could operate as normal and things would just resume as they always did um, so it kind of gives those those main things that we need to focus on um, immediately in order to make that happen. Uh, middle cases, again, with more of a, a drop as a decision being made by June um, and the program starting in August. So it would be kind of like a late spring or late summer into, into early fall um, uh, program. And so we would cut it immensely. It would only have a handful of showings. Um, we would do social distancing um, and assuming it would be required. And so we would implement blanket squares and food truck lines with all kind of of our six feet apart spacing. So really wanting folks to um, give them the tools to be able to social distance appropriately. And then we also look at things like our sponsors and how we would, um, normally our Movies in the Park program has a large sponsor contingency. A lot of our sponsors come out and they wanna interact with our communities. Um, and so this would be uh, showing how we could do that maybe in a more limited way, um, cutting a lot of that kind of on-site presence, but looking at other ways we can give benefits to our sponsors. And then our worst case scenario really looks at, you know, how do we uh, how do we do this virtually? So again, uh, looks at all those kind of things in terms of uh, picking a streaming platform. Would we offer a way to to partner with a local restaurant or restaurants for giving food and alcohol options? Um, do we try to do some sort of uh, social media along with the the movie itself? Um, how do we kind of publish this in a more uh, robust way since it'll be a new way of doing this program? And then compiling, you know, again new sponsor benefits. I think, again, as the team in Seattle said, of just being able to think about what are the ways that we could offer benefits that are different than what we would do if we were in person, but doing them digitally. So this is a just kind of where our heads are in terms of this program um, and really kind of continuing to refine the scenario planning. We know it's never um, perfect. And as we all get new information from our local and state governments, um, we'll continue to adapt these plans to meet those specifications. Um, and again, we, we will continue to kind of roll out what, what um, these these various scenarios look like as we get that information. Um, the next thing I wanted to share was just around um, a risk assessment tool. So the scenario planning is really for things that are within our control, and the risk assessment tool is about things that are not so much in our control. Um, and this was just a really simple tool that we built to help, um, and I've given some example here, but you know we're using this to look at every risk that exists with everything that we're doing, whether it be our programming, our um, fundraising events, um, other, other activations or programs that we offer. Um, um, and what the impact of those risks are, uh, the financial impact of them, and then starting to rank them at, in terms of their severity. So, um, you know, how how severe is this risk if it if it were to occur, occur, and what's the likelihood of that happening? So, our leadership team is going through a scenario right now of um, building out all of the various risks and really kind of looking at their severity and likelihood. And then in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be coming together to then um, to rank them in terms of is this you know high level, I mean, low, medium, high, and extreme. Uh, and we're looking at those that are extreme that are really a really high severity and a, and a, and a, a, a really high likelihood. Um, and then we're putting mitigation plans in place. What are things that we can do to help lessen this risk? What can we do to help risk um, lessen the, the outcomes if these risks actually come to pass? And who on our team is responsible for these? So we're just beginning this exercise. It's something that we discussed last week, um, and we're just beginning to put it into place. But I think it's going to be really helpful in thinking about things that ultimately are out of our control as a nonprofit organization and trying to think if some of these comes to pass, how can we prepare um, to be as, as best um, you know, ready to, to take these on if, if and when they happen. 
Um, and then finally, the last thing I just wanted to talk about and touch on was around communications and what we at Austin Parks Foundation are doing uh, to communicate. Um, and I would say we are trying to over communicate, which I know can be really hard. Um, at this time, we don't want to flood people's inboxes. And so when I say over communicate, I mean a lot um, of thinking of the mediums we're using. So making sure that we are doing everything to communicate with people via email or videos a personal phone calls, social media, just thinking of all the ways that we can connect with our partners and donors and volunteers and, and the general constituency that uses our parks. Um, and really seeing the importance of um, not one thing works for everybody. And so wanting to make sure that we're kind of hitting all um, in the really broadest of communications to make sure that everybody kind of hears the messaging that we want to put out there in regards to using parks safely, the ways in which they can find out um, what parks are available to them and the amenities that are available to them. And then also, again, our programming and the, the free activities that we're trying to do um, in this new normal um, and giving those opportunities to people. Um, and we wanna come from a place of empathy and understanding and collaboration and partnership. Um, and I think I have here around wanting to listen. We know that you know our park adopters and the people who we work with every day um, have different experiences than what we're going through currently. And so um, specifically to those park adopters, so there's about 115 different individuals individuals and groups that help us um, really manage and oversee their neighborhood parks. Um, and so we're using them as, as um, you know, hearing what's happening on the ground in their own neighborhoods and then building tools and resources together that help them um, combat, you know, what they're seeing in their own neighborhood parks. But the important thing for us right now is just to really listen and to communicate as much as possible um, with what we're doing and then hearing from them what it is that we could be doing better. Um, and then I think, you know, uh, the other thing that's really important from our perspective is being really upfront and honest and transparent with changes. Um, so as I mentioned, Movies in the Park, um, as we were supposed to launch in in uh, middle of March, uh, as soon as we knew we weren't going to be able to do that, we broadcast that, that message as far and wide as we could using our uh, public relations and then also our social media and website and email and just letting people know that this is the current reality that we're living in. Um, and as we think about, you know, future programming in terms of our fall fundraiser, that will be the same. As soon as we meet any of those critical deadlines, we'll be communicating that out to our constituents so they know what's coming. Um, I also listed on here spring grants. We want to run a grants program for um, our park adopters and for our local community that helps put dollars back into those neighborhood parks. And we've put the spring grants on hold um, as we uh, make decisions, obviously, with the Parks and Recreation Department about when that can continue. And we're just continuing to communicate and update park adopters and those that would be affected by that um, as much as possible. And then, you know, again, with listening and having conversations, um, you get some really interesting things that come about. And so these are just the final things I wanted to share with you about interesting conversations we're seeing currently. Um, the power of our park adopters, as I mentioned, you know, when you've got local folks on the ground in neighborhood parks, they're hearing and seeing things that we don't necessarily have eyeballs on. And so um, really being able to listen to them and then build resources and toolkits and, um, you know, signage and things that they need in order to make their parks safer. Um, that's how we're really kind of, you know, uh, looking at this situation currently and really wanting to use them more and more um, as, as things lessen and we're able to get back into our communities, being able or in, into our neighborhood parks in a more active way, wanting to be able to make sure that we're hearing um, what's actually happening on the ground and being able to help um, our park adopters work with their neighbors to enter into those spaces safely. Um, we're also thinking a lot about how we can support our community gardens, uh, knowing that those spaces are still currently open as a fruit food resource and being able to provide um, small grants or um, resources in terms of seeds or mulch or tools to be able to allow people to use those spaces safely. So trying to think creatively with our Parks and Recreation Department and also our community partners um, around how they can um, we can better support our community gardens. Um, and we're also thinking about the future of community engagement and knowing that's such a key part of our uh, park planning process. So as we build build new amenities in parks and we redevelop parks, how can we do community engagement when it means we can't be face-to-face -face or in large groups or in you know, our neighborhoods? And so we're having really interesting conversations right now with people that are doing that work um, really well and trying to learn from them so that we can implement new ways of doing community engagement as we embark on new projects in the future. 
And then finally, um, you know, as a nonprofit organization, we have a, a large focus on advocacy. And so as we talk to our, our neighbors and our park adopters, you know, the thing we're really concentrating on is how can we be better advocates for these spaces that people are enjoying and loving so much as mental and physical health respites right now, and make sure that when uh, our city budgeting comes that we are being really good advocates and getting our community to be really good advocates for the Parks and Recreation Department and uh, their budget and ensuring that their budget does not get cut at such a critical time um, and making sure that these spaces stay open um, as they need to so people can use them safely. So again, when you listen and you kind of are, are having uh, detailed communications with all of your constituents, really interesting conversations can come from them. And so these are just a few topics that we're excited to explore more with our, with our uh, neighbors. Um, and that's it from Austin and Austin Parks Foundation. But thank you so much for having us. And uh, we're excited to learn more from the Vancouver team. Thank you, Allison. That was great. Really helpful to hear how you're doing your scenario planning and your risk assessment in particular. All right, we're gonna turn it over to Dave Hutch now, who's the Director of Planning and Park Development at the Vancouver Board of Parks and Recreation. Thanks, Dave. Hi everyone, and um, thank you City Parks Alliance for hosting this and uh, this, this webinar and also inviting us to participate. Um, I'm gonna take a slightly different tact today and talk about um, how we're using um, data and um, <clears throat> how we're using data to um, to understand what's going on in our parks currently and how we will respond to um, to COVID-19. I also just want to say we're really in an unprecedented time here in terms of the importance of parks. Um, we've never seen a time like this where um, you can't go visit friends, you can't have uh, family over um, restaurants, shopping malls, gyms, community centers, everything's closed. So where are people going? They're going to parks um, and they're going, uh, they're going on streets and sidewalks. And so we're really seeing, um, particularly in our context, just the incredible importance and role that parks are playing. And um, we're not quite as advanced in terms of looking at what we're going to be doing this summer and this fall, but we are collecting data and we're starting to think about it. Um, what we're seeing here in, um, in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, this is Google Mobility data, and you can see um, activities in all different sectors of society. We're seeing an incredible increase, 20% uh, more um, use in parks um, compared to the baseline data. Um, again, our kind of demographics and our geography um, is really critical to understanding our park system and how we respond Vancouver is a very dense city. It's one of the most dense cities in North America and um, population of 630,000 in a metro region of about 2.5 um, area of uh, 115 kilometers. It's slightly smaller than, than San Francisco, but we're, um, we're, we're only 4% of the metro land area, but we have 25% of the population. We're a destination as well, and we have about 230 parks. The other thing that's really important to understand about Vancouver is that about 60% of the population lives in 30% of the land mass. So we have a very uh, large uh, single family and duplex zone, which is sort of the blue, and then a high density zone, which is the gray. And here's sort of the makeup of that. So you can see that in single family zone, again, like I said, about 30% of the population the rest is in varying forms of what we call multifamily or attached forms of housing, um, increasingly um, mid-rise to high-rise. So the, the reason why I'm showing you this is because these folks that are living in these attached forms of housing have much less access to private outdoor space, if not any at all. Um, so what did we do immediately? Because we did see this, um, we, we had a spate of very good weather at the onset of the um, of the shell this the um, the measures that were put in place. Um, we implemented something we called Park Champions, and what the champions did uh, are doing is providing information around physical distancing in parks 
and really focusing on hot spots, our destination parks. The champions were redeployed um, community center workers, um, recreation programmers, and youth workers that really had a lot of experience in nonviolent crisis intervention, conflict resolution, and very good interpersonal skills because they were being thrown out there and in, a, in an information role um, with our park users. So here you can see them, they're using hula hoops to show the, the two meters apart in, um, in, in America, be six feet uh, apart rule. Um, and then of course, um, using communication and signage to reinforce that. The other immediate action we did was we, uh, we just needed more capacity in our parks because of the sort of density and the amount of use and their, their limited capacity is we started looking at road, working with our engineering department and looking at road networks next to parks and opening those up for bike and pedestrian use, primarily bike use. We have a very good uh, system of connected bike pathways in, in Vancouver along the waterfront. Um, what we've done is we've moved those out of the parks and onto the roads and key locations uh, along the waterfront destination parks. Um, and then the other big move was making Stanley Park car free which is something we've talked about for years. And this really gave us the opportunity to try it. And it's been a fantastic example. And that allowed us to uh, free up the seawall, the perimeter trail um, from bikes. And it has now organized itself into a two-way uh, pedestrian system that is uh, opening up a lot more room for um, physical distancing, which is key. Um, so what's going, what else is going on? So we really, uh, needed to understand what was going on in the rest of our system and how do we prioritize our efforts um, to keeping the, keeping the system open because what we're hearing from our provincial and regional, which would be like our state and county chief health officers, are that parks are essential for physical and mental health and, um, and that people are encouraged to use them, but to stay local and play local. So how can we ensure that we're managing um, the demand and the capacity of these parks? So we uh, devised um, a system <clears throat> of data collection, um, which I'm gonna speak about in a moment. But um, what we really wanted to know is when, as we were responding to, and taking these interventions, how were they working, um, not only um, in, in sort of the immediate, but over a period of time. We also wanted to avoid further park and amenity closures by understanding how they're being used. And really, again, testing and uh, designing and testing ideas with rapid implementation. And this is something that's been really interesting is the amount of innovation and the productivity uh, in, in this time that we've been able to implement these really quickly. Um, again, determining patterns and then uh, of course, balancing these activities with um, safe access. Um, so when we close down streets, we don't want a street party, but we do want to create more capacity for use um, and for people to be aware and to be safe. So um, in terms of you know, collecting data while this is going on in the bigger picture, really what, as we move into recovery mode, I think there's gonna be a real focus on resilience in cities and the role that parks will play um, in ensuring resilience for major disasters and other forms of emergencies. Um, we need to understand the carrying capacity of parks um, and prioritize the investment. And um, really what all of this is informing the design for major parks. Stanley Park and some of our other major parks if we were designing them for a pandemic, I think we would have looked at the circulation system completely differently. And we really have the opportunity to do that now that we've tested closing them down to vehicles, ensuring um, safe circulation. So we're really looking at that hard in a number of our major park master plans that are, uh, that are in the beginning stages. Again, measuring the demand for different types of park space and finding less used parks and how can we get people to uh, to, to sort of spread the demand around. So what we did is we took a, um, a citywide survey of, uh, of 50 parks uh, across the city, and we were really well positioned to undertake this 
to undertake this survey. And it's an ongoing survey. It's actually happening uh, about four times a week. Um, we had just finished uh, Van Play, our Parks and Recreation Services Master Plan in October. It was uh, approved by our board. And as part of that, we undertook a system of um, observing play and recreation in community study. Um, this, this was developed by Dr. Deborah Cohen of the RAND Corporation. Deborah Cohen, Dr. Cohen actually came up to Vancouver and trained some of my staff in the, um, in the uh, collection methodology. And we were able to apply that to this very rapidly to this, this uh, survey. We also used our park provision study. You can see there's a link there too, where we um, really did a lot of uh, work understanding the walk shed of each parks and also the amount of people that you would be sharing that park with. So the density or the, um, the amount of hectares or, or uh, acres of land per thousand people within a 10 minute walking distance of those people. So the survey approach is really a daily observational snap snapshot of um, data gathering. It's alternating um, noon and early evening, times when we know um, our parks are really busy. There's 50 parks across the city, and those were chosen with the highest population density around them and not just the hotspots. We have 18 staff surveying their local parks. Um, and because um, my team is working from home, this was really easy to implement. So we divided up the city based on where folks lived, and they were able to pick two to three parks in their neighborhood and just quickly um, quickly uh, gather that data. It's an online survey, input into your cell phone, and the analysis tool, very simple, using Excel, and we're able to publish the results the next morning. Here's just a, a quick map showing. You can see uh, there's a concentration around the downtown peninsula where we do have a lot of people living. Um, and here's a, um, here's a sample of the survey. So very simple, uh, you know, where are you at? What's the weather, time, date? How many people observed? What percentage of people observed are social distancing? So it's a sliding scale. Um, are there any pinch points? So pinch points meaning, do we have trail, um, pedestrian, bike, um, parking, um, vehicle conflicts that need to be dealt with? Um, describe them and uh, are there any, um, we're collecting a lot of data on uh, dogs off leash. Vancouver, dogs are very popular in Vancouver and we want to ensure that people are using them safely. So what by synthesizing this data very quickly and publishing it the next morning to the leadership team, it allows them to prioritize and direct efforts all the way from the park champions who are kind of our soft touch in the parks for information to our park operations who would actually go out and implement any measures and rain, park rangers and police enforcement if we need a, a heavier hand in terms of enforcement. Um, what it, what this does is um, this allows us to um, obviously keep parks open longer, but make evidence-based solutions um, and creating new processes for decision making. It also allows us, it's going to allow us to look back and see what actually happened on the ground during a pandemic, during an emergency. And that's really what um, this slide is t telling us. One of the, uh, one of the, Key outcomes of our uh, van play park master plan, parks and recreation master plan, was to ensure that we're gathering data and making um, data and um, database decisions. So we move beyond crisis management and we have well-informed recovery efforts. So that's our next step to move to. And, um, and like it says here, data to inform future uh, managed access and opening, and, um, and really to show us where we need to focus um, at the time of crisis. So here's just what we're seeing. Here's just over uh, a few days. We're seeing a very high level of compliance in terms of physical distancing, which is great. Um, it's, it's comforting to know that people are engaged and we do have some information on you know, where it's not happening and where work, more work is needed to be done and deploying park champions or rangers uh, if necessary in those locations. So we're seeing an over 80% um, compliance on physical distancing. And for those of you who you know, probably haven't been following how COVID-19 is playing out in Canada, British Columbia it has the lowest infection rate in Canada and we're probably um, the, the closest to moving to more recovery efforts the soonest. 
Um, so we're very we're very lucky in that regard, and uh, and we you know our public health system has really um, really guided us through this and really um, um, ensured that we're all being safe and aware. And I think really as a result uh, are moving towards these these recovery efforts. Um, so like I said, um, that, you know we're seeing in groups where we need more work, uh, young adults, um, you know. People are obviously attempting it, but not quite sitting two meters apart, which is six feet. Um, and our sports fields are being used very well as passive open spaces. Loop trails are incredibly valuable. That's a very simple thing that we're, we're gonna be looking at as we get into park redevelopment and investments in the future. And we've been able to reduce pinch points uh, from being observed within a week through direct action. So by uh, documenting those, deploying the, the park champions, and parks ops to uh, deal with those pinch points. So that's it. Uh, that's it from us. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it back over to Karen. Thank you, Dave. That was really, really interesting. And what a great strategy for being able to monitor the safe use of parks and collect data. Um, it seems like a great model for others to use as they start thinking about how to reopen parks safely. Um, being able to have the data on um, safe use of parks it seems critical to that. Uh, we don't have a lot of time for questions. We've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, so I'm going to have just a couple of questions for, um, for the group. Um, you actually answered a lot of the ones that people had submitted already. The first one uh, I'm going to give to Dave. Um, how are you preparing staff for the gradual reopening uh, of uh, and normal operations? And what staffing changes are you anticipating making? Well, I think, you know, uh, as I said, I think we're still really in a response mode and how we're preparing staff is really, you know, um, with our park champions, the weather is starting to warm up here. We're starting to see more people in parks. Will we be needing to deploy more, ch more park champions? Um, that is something that we're, we're having to look at um, in terms of getting them in the field and in those, in those hot spots. Our beaches, we're an oceanfront um, city, and so our beaches, as the weather will warm, um, will become another area of, of focus in, in terms of ensuring that we have our champions there. We know many people go to beaches not just to swim, but just to uh, to be outside and and be in the outdoors. So um, it's something we're going to have to we're going to have to monitor and and continue to watch as the weather and our our survey data tells us what our demand is going to be. Great, thanks. We got a lot of questions about summer programming and how to keep kids engaged. Um, so, uh, Justin, you guys talked a lot about that. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on your ideas for keeping kids engaged if summer camps either don't happen or they can't accommodate the usual number of kids? What are your contingency plans there? Yeah, I think, you know, currently we are operating some emergency child care based on sort of the best thinking of our team and folks from public health and looking at models from other cities where it really is kind of eight youth in a cohort. Each cohort needs to have a dedicated space uh, that, you know, no more than 50 folks congregating in a building. And that's kind of our current kind of emergency assumptions. So we are thinking about the summer as can we operate with those same assumptions going forward, right? And, and that's kind of the state of the planning at the moment that we can, we may be able to run summer camps with those same basic parameters. That's not a final decision. That's kind of where we're thinking about now. Um, and if we do that, we know we're going to be serving far fewer youth. So we are contemplating uh, kind of an expanded um, uh, park program. So what it looks like, you know, every year we do this at five sites, um, but thinking about expanding that this year where uh, sort of a drop-in program um, at parks. Uh, we call it the Summer of Safety um, and the Summer Lunch and Playground program as well. So uh, <clears throat> really it's sort of just some staff there at popular parks that youth come to. And the basic idea is we know these young people are gonna be wandering around the neighborhood, visiting parks, trying to come to the community centers that are closed, right? And, we, and uh, how do we provide some structured activity to keep them safe as a safety net? And uh, it's a program we've built up over several years, and I think we're contemplating what does expansion look like, right? Can we add that to more parks um, because we don't want any crowding happening in any specific park? Can we look at where there's young people who are and are not being served by our, our registered programs, and can we make sure to push the, that, that program there? I think um, 
you know, and how do we how do we staff this program, right? And can we sort of redeploy uh, existing staff who, under normal circumstances, would be in a building, but if that building is totally full of childcare um, and closed to the public, other than for childcare, right? Can that staff be out helping lead activities for you? So I, I don't, again, still in the planning phases, still thinking about it, um, but I think we we do feel a need to to try to fill that gap and help um, help make sure those folks have care. Great, thanks. Well, I know you're all following CDC guidelines and guidelines from your local health professionals. Uh, so I was just wondering, are there any other standards or protocols or any other um, processes that you're using to make decisions uh, here? Um, and uh, Lakima, how about if I go to you? Yeah, well, in regards to making decisions, the city of Seattle in about 2004 committed to racial social justice initiative. And it's a key strategy to uh, focus on race because we know that most disparities uh, when most hit are hit by um, are most impacted with marginalized communities. So when we're looking at our decision making, we're always looking at is who will be most impacted and how will they be impacted? Are there any negative consequences to these conversations and then also including them in the con conversations so that we're not blindsided in regards to what we think versus to what their needs are. Uh, so we are doing that in, in different pockets. We're also engaging with communities, with our community engagement ambassadors uh, program, and as well as uh, engaging and working with organizations to help to do some stream, some live streaming fitness classes right now. And so they're also um, eyes and ears on the ground for what community are needing right now, um, and and ensuring that we are addressing the needs of our communities that are most impacted by this, not only systems that are embedded, um, that have created these inequities, but also how it's being uh, illuminated within this COVID-19 pandemic, right? Uh, and keeping those issues at hand. And we utilize uh, the framework of the Race and Social Justice Initiative to help inform those decisions and communications and engagement. Great, that's really helpful to be thinking about. And another perspective on thinking just beyond the health requirements, but really what's the uh, equitable impacts or, or inequitable impacts of that and how are you addressing it? So thank you. Um, you touched a little bit about uh, communication and uh, there were a lot of questions on um, how are you communicating with patrons and volunteers, both in terms of logistics as well as higher level messaging about what the future holds. Um, Allison, you, you talked a lot about communication and, and relationships with community organization. Um, do you want to just talk a, a, elaborate a little bit more about how you're keeping people engaged during this time? Sure. Um, yeah, I think as I mentioned in my slides, you know, it's really about using all kinds of different mediums, uh, knowing that not one single medium fits everybody. Um, so we're doing everything from filming messages uh, from our CEO to uh, sending postcards and handwritten notes to people, just letting them know that we're thinking about them. Uh, we are obviously communicating via social media and our website and, uh, and, and you know, kind of all of those electronic means that everyone's doing. And then again, as I mentioned, really trying to, um, and it sounds like every group is really doing this in some way, whether it be the park champions in, in Vancouver or, you know, the teams that they have in Seattle, really trying to get people that are, um, you know, on the ground being that voice to communicate with their neighbors. Um, around what to do, what not to do, other things that they may not realize are available to them in terms of uh, park activities to do at home or or in your own kind of uh, green space in your backyard if you have one. Um, and so, yeah, we're using those park adopters to really be that voice in, in neighborhoods specifically. And then, as I mentioned, really trying to use their ears on the ground to help inform um, how else we should be communicating. Um, so we're trying to just pepper as much as we can throughout various uh, mediums. Uh, but we're always looking for for new ways um, and hoping that we're hearing from from those people on the ground that can help inform uh, new and creative ways we should be uh, communicating with the community. Great, thank you. Uh, and then, of course, we had a lot of questions about generating revenue, and um, some of you touched on that there's huge revenue impacts of this for parks departments. Um, and we're a lot of questions. There were a lot of questions around how are you thinking about generating revenue in the absence of recreation programs and other fees. Um, so Dave, I'm gonna to turn to you. Do you have any thoughts to share about generating revenue during this time? Yeah, certainly. Um, so we've just turned our attention to this, this idea 
in the, in the last week. I feel like here in British Columbia, we've turned a corner in terms of flattening the curve. And so now our chief provincial medical health officers is saying we can start looking at a very cautious and gradual reopening of some uh, activities. And there are things we're exploring. And again, these are very early days. No decisions have been made. But things like we have three municipal golf courses. Golf, if set up um, properly, has a distancing measure built into it. Um, we're looking at our concessions, our food service. We have a lot of people out in our parks. We've closed down our concessions, but takeout, of course, is available in many, many restaurants. And so we can provide that service now that uh, the weather's warmed up. Parking, we have a lot of, you know, we're a very dense city. We have a lot of pay parking lots in our parks. They were closed down to help manage. So using the data, we can carefully decide where we can open some of those parking lots without contributing to more congestion and uh, gradually have some revenue start to reoccur, which of course is critical for the operations of the entire system. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, that was our last question. I'd like to thank the speakers. This was really tremendous. We had a lot of interest in how organizations are handling this transition. So thank you. I uh, just wanted to let attendees know that um, for the webinars that we've already done, you can go to the events tab at cityparksalliance.org, um, as well as for information on upcoming webinars, we will be continuing to have these. So please save the date also for the City Parks Alliance's Greater and Greener International Urban Parks Conference, which will be taking place July 2021 in Philadelphia. The conference is a great opportunity for us to connect in person and discuss with peers and uh, coming on the heels of all of this, it will be a great time for us to uh, connect on how we're, we've our, made our cities more resilient as a result of all of this. So uh, thank you to our speakers for joining us today and for sharing such great information about how you're taking a positive and proactive approach to planning for the summer and beyond, despite these challenging circumstances. Uh, by Monday afternoon, you'll receive an email with links to today's recording, as well as related resources. And lastly, City Parks Alliance is striving to adapt its programming to be responsive to the changing needs of park professionals during this challenging time. Support from members is critical to enable CPA to continue to offer this programming. If you'd like to join City Parks Alliance, please visit cityparksalliance.org slash join. Thanks to all of you, our attendees, for joining us today. Please take a minute to fill out the short evaluation that will pop up on your screen after this session concludes. Keep up the great work that you're doing in our nation's urban parks. Thank you.